I want to share something with you right quick before I get into the lesson. Um, we're talking about Daniel. Maybe you hadn't thought of this before. Turn over with me just real brief. It won't take long. Daniel chapter 7, just a minute. I want to, I want to show you something here. Uh, maybe you hadn't thought of if you have read through, through the book of Daniel. Maybe you read over, uh, over it. Uh, I want to look at... Daniel 7, particularly verse 13, but you recall this is the vision of Daniel seeing the Ancient of Days. Of course, the Ancient of Days being God. Now, look at verse 13 just a minute, and you might want to mark this in your Bible, even come back and look at it a little later. Uh, he said, I saw in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient days and was presented before him. We have that fulfillment of, prophecy, of that prophecy. Turn over to Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. Acts chapter 1 verse 9. Very familiar passage. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Now what we have between Acts chapter 1 verse 9 and Daniel chapter 7 verse 13, we have Christ ascending from the earth, Daniel showing you the other side through prophecy coming to Christ leaving the earth, coming to the Ancient of Days. To me, that's one of the most amazing scriptures in the Bible. Mark that. Keep that with you. I won't charge you any extra for that. That's, that I think that's a good passage uh, to consider. Now, I think I am going to come back. I feel like I'm closer to you this way. Talking about eschatology, we've, we've been through this before, so I won't take time to go through all this. We have the three doctrines, amillennialism, premillennialism, postmillennialism, and if I had a chauffeur, I'd have him stand up and tell you all about it. If you don't know that, you need to go listen to a little bit of Jerry Clower and you'll understand what I'm saying. <clears throat> but that's the views we have. Now, in that reading you heard just a few minutes ago, you would say, Mike, we might as well go home. That sounds like premillennialism is exactly right. Did you hear all that that said in that passage? That's got to be that thousand year reign. And you, you hear that on the surface and that's the way it sounds. But let's go through that. Will Christ reign on the earth a thousand years? That's where, what we're talking about. And that's what we're looking at this morning. Of course, here's this, this chart. I know you guys are tired of seeing that chart too. I apologize. But I just want to concentrate. We're concentrating on that millennium, the Satan-bound idea, Satan being loosed, I, that's the point. We've already talked about all the other. <clears throat> and looky there, I was right earlier, Battle of Armageddon's what it was there at the beginning. They say it's fault, and then Gog and Magog out here on the end when the wicked are judged. That's what they tell you about that. And we won't go through all that spill they have on that. Okay, basic elements of this doctrine. The kingdom is yet to be established. That's one. The kingdom will be a literal, material kingdom. That's two. Christ will come back and reign on a literal throne. Now there is a view of this doctrine that is referred to by various names, and they bring the United States and Great Britain into this thing. And maybe years ago, if you heard a man named Herbert W. Armstrong, he was the proponent, and he's the one that really had this thing going. And the idea was to get the throne that Jesus is going to sit on, they've got to go to London, England, they've got to throw the old queen off that throne, and they've got to bring that throne to Jerusalem, and that's the one he's got to sit on to be the throne. They've, somehow they've got that throne as being the throne of David. What we used to call that in the rural country of Arkansas was hogwash. Maybe you guys did too. 
Doesn't make sense, does it? But that was, that was the idea of that. And then, of course, we have a thousand-year reign and bliss and peace is what we have. So that's the basic idea. And, of course, don't forget the Jews returning to Palestine. I remember one time I went over to that part of the country and got back, and somebody asked me, says, did you see a lot of Jews coming back in over there? And I said, no, but I saw a lot of old buzzard, bald-headed guys coming in. Didn't miss, you missed that, did you? Okay. All right. Here's the problem with that. It's not in the Bible. I'll just say that right at the outset of the lesson. The kingdom has been established. We're not looking for the kingdom to be established. We're not looking at the idea that the church was established and then the kingdom's going to be established later. That the kingdom has been established and Christ is on David's throne. He don't have to be on King, Queen Elizabeth's throne. He's on David's throne. And the second coming ends Christ's reign. We've been emphasizing that. Revelation 20 does not teach it. And we'll get into that. And then we're going to look at consequences. So this is kind of the flow of this lesson this morning. So, no, Christ will not reign for a thousand years. We can stop the lesson and go home. Oh, some people might be appreciative of that. Okay, let's go and look. First of all, it's not in the Bible. We understand we must teach and believe only what is found in the Bible. And that's for certain. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, Paul said. I spoke what I believe. I believe what has been written. 1 Peter 4 11. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Speak as the oracles of God. Or we speak where the Bible speaks, silent, we're silent where the Bible's silent. Remember that of kind of a play off of 1 Peter 4, verse 11. Then we must always check what we are taught by the Bible. I don't care who's preaching, have your Bible open and check. Somebody mentioned Stonewall to me last night. And I remember years ago when I lived in Bossier City, this was, oh man, uh, Eddie would say many hairs ago, but I'll say many years ago. Uh, it was way back, might have been when I was in the military, even so that was way back. I went to, they were in a smaller building, and I went to a congregation. The guy was preaching in a meeting, and there was a lady kind of sitting. I was sitting in the back, and there was a lady kind of sitting over this way from me, and she was uh, following the passages, and she had turned to the passage, and she had every once in a while, she had amen. Yeah, that's what her Bible, Bible says. And all at once, the guy was up there. He was quoting a passage and reading the passage, and she's over there, oh, preacher. Oh, what in the world's going on? She said, whoa, preacher. He'd read a little more, whoa, preacher. I thought, man, why she fixed to get up there and whip that guy? And she said, oh, hold on, preacher. She said, I was on the wrong page. <laughs> she was checking. I mean, but she was checking what was being said. So make sure you're on the right page, I'll say. It's the idea. So we must check. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. These Jews were more noble, or some translations say more fair-minded, than those in Thessalonica. Why? They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Examine them. Whoever teaches, examine what he says. Try the spirits, John, 1 John 4, verse 1. And then it must harmonize all the Bible. What the premillennialist does, he comes up with a theory and then he goes trying to force scriptures to harmonize with what his theory is. That's not the way it works. You don't. That's called, by the way, that's called deductive studying. You ever heard of deduct you ever heard of inductive study? Deductive studies where you have a preconceived idea, you come in, you're looking for scriptures that'll shore up what your mindset, your thought is. Inductive study is where you go to the Word of God asking the five uh, journalistic questions, who, what, when, where, and why. 
out of the scripture and let the scripture tell you what it's saying. Let it show you. That's called inductive Bible study. That's really the better kind of study than coming in with preconceived ideas. Harmonize the Bible. Revelation 20 doesn't teach it. We'll talk about that a little bit later. We're not going to forget about that. <clears throat> all right. Daniel 244. We're all familiar. The kingdom to be established during the Roman Empire. Now they make a, the premillennialist makes a big deal out of those toes. You say, huh? You make a big deal out of toes, the feet, because they're ever mixed with clay and iron. And so what they try to tell you about that, that clay and iron represents a revived Roman Empire that is going to come much later than that empire back that came in 63 B.C. Pompey brought in, you know, Romulus and Remus and all, all that uh, come, comes in. That story comes in during the silent period of the Testaments. They say that there's going to come a revived Roman Empire on down the road from our time period. So that's how they get around that. They get two Roman empires out of that. The Bible doesn't teach two Roman empires. It teaches, teaches one. So Daniel 2.44, the God of heaven in the days of those kings, Roman kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. See, they, if they get that thing to a revised Roman empire, then they can say, yeah, he's setting up a kingdom and a thousand year reign on the earth. There it is. And you know, if we play with those feet a little bit, well, that sounds funny too, don't it? But, but if we mess with that a little bit, that idea a little bit, maybe we bring that in, the ideas. But Daniel 2.44 says, God will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another. It shall break in pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end. Some in the time of Christ would live in, to see the kingdom. Remember we talked about the generations. We talked about the you. We talked about the shortly come to pass in Revelation 1. Uh, John was told these things shortly come to pass. Mark 9, 1. Remember that passage? Jesus says, truly I say to you. Do we have to go through that you again? We don't need to do that, do we? No, we won't go through that. You heard that in class. I say to you, the ones he's talking to, there are some standing here. Any of us standing there? No. But said some standing here who will not taste death till, do I have to talk about Buster again? I'll leave him out too. Until, till what? They see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now you can see that if you can see through a barrel with both ends knocked out. What that's talking about. Their lifetime. It's going to come. Matthew 16, verse 28, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. So when does that tell us that kingdom's coming? 2,000 years from then? No. Jesus said some of those people in His day, that's what He says. Paul wrote to the people in the kingdom. Look at Colossians 1 verse 13. He has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and has translated, translated, you ever do any translating? You go overseas, you have to have somebody translate for you. You get into the Philippines, they have 78 dialects. I was over there one time and I had three translators. I would speak, this guy would speak, this guy would speak, this guy would speak, and then it'd be my turn. I thought I had that thing all figured out one time, and one of them spoke out of turn, really had it all messed up. But you go overseas, but you're going to have to have a translator, and you're going to have to trust him. One guy translated me one time. I said, did I say all that? But translated. Translated what? Into the kingdom of his dear son. Paul wrote to people who were in the kingdom when he wrote Colossians. Was Paul mistaken? Did he have that all messed up? And then John and other Christians were in the kingdom. Look at Revelation 1, verse 6. Revelation, no, that's not mine. Revelation, I saw something on the ground, thought I'd drop something. Revelation 1, verse 6 made us. A 
kingdom. Catch that. Priest to his God and Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Revelation 5 verse 10. You have made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they shall reign on the earth. You hear that? John and other Christians were in the kingdom at that time. All right, now the kingdom again has been established. Matthew 16, verse 18. We're all familiar with this passage. He said, I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, are they building the church on Peter? No. Catholic Church wants to tell you the church was built on Peter. Doesn't say that. So the confession that he had made, you go back and get the confession, that's what he's talking about. Where was it? I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Underscore that. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Greek says shall have been. In other words, it's already been bound. Shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth again shall have been loosed. Peter's not making laws. What I'm simply saying. That's not giving the Pope authority to make and change laws. Not what he's doing there. Now, notice, I will build my church, kingdom of heaven. What's that tell us? That tells us that the church and the kingdom are the same. Church is not a substitute because the kingdom couldn't be established. Not what it is. They're the same, what we're, what we're seeing there. Here it is, passages that show that. Colossians 1, verse 18, he's the head of the church. Colossians 1, 13, kingdom. Or 118, sorry, 18 and 13. Uh, subjects of the kingdom. Romans 1 and verse 5. Romans 1, okay, Rom 1 and verse 5. We have. And then we have subjects of the kingdom. Acts 2, 39, territory. You see, all that shows the church and the kingdom are the same. I think it's maybe on the hand out there somewhere. I'm not sure. Okay, I tried to get it there. All right. Oh, okay. I got them all in here. I just didn't really. Okay. So Christ is on David's throne now. Daniel 7, 13. I should have waited on that while ago. Oh, shit, I forgot I had this in here, but here it is. Daniel 7, 13. He received the kingdom when he ascends to the ancient of days. Remember we went through that in Acts 1, verse 9? Jesus got there. He received the kingdom. That's what that's, that's showing there. Daniel shows Zechariah 6, verse 12. He's king and priest on the, on the throne. Couldn't be on the earth. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 4. Now if he were on earth, listen to this, he would not be a priest at all since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. I'm talking about the law of Moses there. He was of the wrong tribe. He was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Remember Melchizedek, Abraham's time? Abraham played, paid tithes to Melchizedek. The idea there? He was the king of Salem. Throne is in the sky. Psalm 89, verse 35, beginning. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness... I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever and ever. His throne, as long as the sun before me, like the moon, it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. So the throne's in the sky. And he's on the throne. Again, Zechariah 6, verse 12. <clears throat> We have here, he said to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold the man whose name is Branch, for he shall branch out from his place. He shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. And he's a priest now. And, of course, Acts 20, verse 30 through 36 points out 
he is at the right hand of God, on his throne at the right hand of God. There it is. Being therefore a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants, he's talking about David here now, set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. David gives you the interpretation. You don't have to come up with your own interpretation. David said he spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. That's what Peter says there. There it is. <clears throat> underscored for you. I know I go crazy with my underscoring, but there it is. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having what? Received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. David did not ascend into the heavens. It wasn't David he was talking about, see, he says. But he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, God said to Jesus, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till, there's that buster illustration again, till I make your enemies your footstool. When's that? Till the end of time. He's sitting on that throne till the end of time. Okay. You pass my underscore. Verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain, or one translation says, for a surety. You can take it to the bank. When you know it, you can say, Bob's your uncle. You take it to the bank. That God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Wasn't trying to be politically correct, was he? Wasn't trying to keep him hurting feelings, was he? He told them how the cow ate the cabbage, it was you. He says, God had sworn with an oath. He would raise up. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords now, not in some future. Jesus is reigning till this points out. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Then it is coming. Those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God. The Father after destroying every rule. Every authority. Every power. There it is. There's the underscore. The resurrection. Each in his first order. The resurrection. Last trump. Not Donald there. John 5, 28. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming, one hour, in which all who are in the graves, all who is that? Righteous, unrighteous, right? That's not just righteous, is it? No. That's all. A-L-L. -L. We'll hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. There they're both talked about. They're both described. They're all coming out at the same time, he says there. There it is again, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23, each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. 50 verse, uh, through 55, talks about this I say brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does corruption inherit incorruption behold I tell you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye how fast is the twinkling of an eye you ever play the game you're out if you blink first and you're sitting there looking intently at the other person's eyes oh you blink you have to catch it real quick don't you that it, that it happens so in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, and again, not Donald, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. Notice that, shall, we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption has put on incorruption, this mortal will put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? 
Then 1 Thessalonians 4.13 we've dealt with. This, again, the second coming ends Christ's reign. The idea of till. Then comes the end, not the beginning. He said then comes the end. He doesn't say, well, then comes the millennial kingdom. He doesn't say that. Comes the end. He put all enemies under his feet. Here it is. When Jesus returns, all who are in the grave will hear his voice. We went through that. There's Matthew 25, 31 through 46. You read that. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 7. We read, we've covered that already. We've covered 2 Peter 3, 10. <clears throat> Revelation 20 doesn't teach it. Here's problems with that interpretation. With interpreting that literally. That's what they have to do. They have to interpret Revelation 20 literally to get it to say that. And we're going we're gonna to point that out here. Must be consistent with the theme of the book. To interpret that way, we're not being consistent with the theme of the book of Revelation. Must Now here's the big, here's the big catch. Must properly recognize and understand the figurative language used. Now get that. We've got to get that point. Must realize symbols do not symbolize themselves. Don't make sense, huh? Let me say that again. Symbols do not symbolize themselves. A thousand years doesn't represent a literal thousand years. That's basically what we're saying. When you have a thousand years figuratively, that don't mean a thousand years literally. That's what, what we're saying. And that's what we're talking about here. Must not contradict other passages. And we've shown how that would contradict other passages through this study. Now notice. Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant, now underscore this next part right here, things which must shortly take place. He sent an, what's that next word on the screen? He sent an signified, what's that? Symbolized, symbol, signs. He signified it by his angel to his servant John. Now, grab a hold of that. Having sent apostello is what we have there. Same word in Revelation 22, verse 6. Revelation 1, 3, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and keep what is written in it for the time is 3,000 years off. Is that right? See, you told me that's, that's wrong. The time is near. If something's near to you, is it a thousand miles away? Or is it a mile from you? You know, that pulpit's near to me. It's not in the other end of the building. It's near. Is the idea. We all, we all understand that. Revelation 119. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those uh, that are and those that are to take place after this. Over and over again, the book of Revelation said these things are going to take place shortly. Not looking a thousand, two thousand years. Okay, again, what must ta uh, take, uh, soon take place? Uh, the time is near, Revelation 22, 10. So it's written primarily, the book of Revelation, and I'm no Revelation expert. Eddie told me he was, but I'm no Revelation no, no, that ain't what you said. You said you thought I was going to say that. I'm sorry. Uh, written primarily to encourage Christians living at the time, what it was for, 
written largely, here it is, in symbolic language, interpretation must agree with the context of the book. If a scripture doesn't have a context, it's a pretext. You heard that before? What that means, you can make, you can make scripture teach anything you want to if you pull it out of its context. For example, Judas went and hung himself. Another passage of scripture says, go and do likewise. Now, am I to take that and say, okay, Judas hung himself, so you go hang yourself? Is that what that means? No, it's just two, it's two different contexts. I took it out of context to get it to say what I wanted it to say, because maybe I didn't like you and I wanted you to kill yourself. You can't do that. That's not the way you handle scripture. It must agree with the rest of the Bible. It uses Old Testament terminology. Farrell Jenkins, his um, dissert, not dissertation, his, uh, I'm trying to think, master's thesis, thesis, that's it, that's the word I want. His thesis was written on the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. He did his thesis on those 400 illusions, a very good book. You want to go read more about that, go get his, he, he's published it, go get it. It's, it's there, uh, you can get it to the Old, the Old Testament are made in the book of Revelation. A lot of that language you find in the book of Daniel, you find in the book of Ezekiel, helps you understand what's written in the book of Revelation. Now again, I'm no expert, I'll leave that to Eddie. Or someone else that wants to tackle it. So that's what we have there. Visions are not necessarily chronological. We see that in the book of Daniel. But often, Recapitulations, well, that's a big word to say with false teeth, recapitulations of various visions, different pictures of same event. You study the book of Revelation, you can see at least four parallels going through the book of Revelation, uh, events told in one way, and then the next time you come back and it's told in another way. And, and you, you, you see that. Uh, I've got a workbook on the book of Revelation. I present it from that, from that uh, viewpoint uh, of seeing that with these uh, visions in the book of Revelation. Must seek to grasp the vision or series of visions as a whole without pressing the details of each symbol. Now, that's, that's key. I had to learn that real quick in electronics. I go, go to repair something. And I had to learn, once I had it repaired, Mike, you need to move off of that because there's other things you've got to do. But I, my mind would, well, why did that part go bad to begin with? What caused that part to go bad? Can I go, you know, you don't have time for that. You don't have time to press all that. Fix it if it, if it breaks again, then maybe you're going to have to get into that. But you take care of the problem that you have right now and move on. And so what we have here, you don't try to go and get little minute details out of every, every symbol you see. That's, that's the idea. Understand difficult passages in light of clearer passages. Now I tell you, you're talking about meetups. This would probably be one of the first things that would be go, good to go over in a meetup to try to get an understanding among the everybody that's studying, that this is what we adhere to. Make all interpretations consistent with teachings of the whole Bible. Again, the Bible has to harmonize, right? It's what we have. So Revelation 20 does not teach it. Now, I've got the American Standard Version up here, and I really believe the American Standard Version the old 1901, now I'm not talking about New American Standard. I'm going back to 1901 version. I believe that version, that translation was probably more accurate than any translation that we've, we've had. And so the American Standard Version, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven. I won't bother to read this. Brother did a good job reading it. I, just, I don't want to ruin that. But let me, let me go on just a minute. Satan bound in different ways. 
You know, the idea of the big play, they've got that thousand years in there. They've got Satan bound at the end of it, Revelation 20. But let's look at other places that talks about Satan being bound. Look here, Satan trying Job. Job chapter 1, verse 12. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. See, Satan, here, here now, look at how he binds Satan. Here's the, here's the bounds. Here's the limits. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. Satan, you can afflict him. Here's your limit. Here's how you're bound to what you can do to Job. Do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Job 2 verse 6. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Now the bound is lifted a little bit. You can now afflict him. But here's the limit again. Only spare his life. So that's the idea of binding of Satan when it comes to the trying of Job. How about the strong man? Now again, the premillennialist wants to bind, wants to apply this to Jesus Christ and the rejection of the Jews rejecting him. They want to say that Jesus was bound uh, and he was talking about that with this illustration here. But notice this. Matthew 12, 29. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first, what? Binds, there's a binding of the strong man. I'm going to break in Eddie's house and if I know he's got a whole arsenal in there, I'm going to somehow keep him from getting to those because I know he's going to blow a hole through me if I, if I do that, if he can get to those guns. So I bound him if I got to where he can't get to his guns. I have bound him in, in that way. He's going to have to find another means to get me out of there. What we're talking about. Satan fell. Luke 10 verse 17. 72 return with joy. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Revelation 12, 9, a great, the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown. Boy, you talk about theories they come up with on that. But again, symbolic language. Idea of, of bound set. Cross despoiled the principalities and powers. Notice, Colossians 2.15, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put to open shame by what? Triumphing over them. Colossians 2.15. Revelation 21 through 3, Satan is bound so he can deceive the nations no more. The idea. And then, what do we have? Come on, punch it up. Verse 8, he shall come forth to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together. There's that war we was talking about before, was supposed to be right before this millennial kingdom. The number of whom is as the sand of the sea, and they went up the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down out of heaven and devoured them and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone for also the beast and false prophets and they shall be tormented day and night how long forever and ever so again symbols here's the symbols coming up populated the keys the abyss the great chain the dragon is that literal That'd be a big chain, you read, read that, that'd be a big literal, that's not literal. The dragon, a thousand years, again, that's, that's figurative language. Thrones, figurative language, the beast, the mark. Oh, there's all kinds of things been said to mark. We've got the UPC codes and it said, oh man, that's mark of the beast. Don't buy anything with a UPC code on it. You realize you can't buy anything that doesn't have a UPC code on it? Unless you're selling it yourself. But people will say that. First resurrection, four corners of the earth, the camp of the saints, the beloved city, all that symbols in Revelation 20. 
So things that are not in this chapter related to this thousand-year reign. The bodily resurrection of the saints is not talked about in Revelation 20. Jesus setting one foot on earth is not mentioned in Revelation 20. The duration of Jesus' reign is not mentioned. The city of Jerusalem, the temple, the throne of David is not mentioned. The conversion of Jews and us, the U.S., or us, not mentioned. Well, what does Revelation 20 teach? It teaches the vindication of those saints martyred and persecuted by Rome. That's what it teaches. Satan's use of Rome will come to an end through the power of the gospel. That's what he's showing. Those who die for Christ are real victors. That's what Revelation is written for, to show, to give them strength, to, to help them to see there's going to be a final victory. There's going to be final victory. It's symbolically indicated by the number for perfect completeness. Numbers represent things. You have six, the number of man, short of perfection. You have seven, number of God, that's showing perfection. Six, 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 that's short of perfection. Is the idea so sim symbolized things? Ten representing a completeness. Ten times ten representing a complete completedness. And we see with those with those type of figures over and over again. We see and there's passages uh, showing that. The angel having the key to the abyss, the binding of Satan, not able to deceive nations, loosing of Satan for a little time. Satan's ability once again to deceive nations. The thrones, authority of the apostles through the gospel. The reign of the faithful, the spread, that's the spread and success of the gospel. The martyr's death vindicated for a long time, completed period. The rest of the dead come to life. The brief spread and success of false religion. A rebirth of, of the persecution of the church. Verse 5. Deceiving nations. Verse 8. How about the Jews returning to Palestine? They make a big play on that. Remember I told you about the people who went over there. They asked me, did I see many Jews returning? And I said, no, but I saw a lot of bald-headed buzzards coming over there. And don't get mad at me. Notice the land promise. Premillennialist says it's yet to be fulfilled. Let's, let's examine that a little bit. For all the land which you see, he tells Abraham, I give to you and your descendants forever. Genesis 15, 8. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I will... I have given you this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, uh, the river Euphrates. And then he names them, the Canaanites, the Kezites, the Cabanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the uh, Rahab, uh, Rephim, Rephim, sorry about that, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. A lot of sites there. Not a website in there, though. Then... Genesis 17, verse 7. I just thought of that. That wasn't good, was it? And I will establish my covenant between me and you. You and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. He says, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their gods. Well, let's see how that's been fulfilled. Has it been fulfilled? Prima Lilith says, no, it hasn't been fulfilled. That's yet to be fulfilled. That's got to happen. Well, let's look at Joshua chapter 21. Joshua chapter 21, and in verse 43. Verse 43, so the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn. Whoa, whoa, read that again. Slow, let's slow down on that. So the Lord gave to Israel. 
What did he give to Israel? All. A-L-L. -L. Remember that illustration about son coming and getting $5 from you, coming back five minutes later, you hadn't been to the bank, he's wanting some more money, what do you got to say if you told him you've given it all to him? You're either a liar or you say, son, I don't have any more money. All means all of it. So all, no more land to give. Said the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give to their fathers. Remember what we read about Abraham. And they took possession of it and dwelled in it. Did Israel get the land? Joshua says they got the land. Verse 44, the Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies to their hand. Not a word, get this, failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. And look at this now. You want to see that? Look at this. What's that say? All came to pass. All of it came to pass. It was all fulfilled. There it is. Then Joshua 23. Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and all your souls that not one of the things has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. Didn't fail. 1 Kings 4, 31. Solomon. Let's look at Solomon where he reigned. Solomon reigned over all, there's that word A-L-L -L again, all kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines. That's the Negev over there close to the Mediterranean. You don't know what the Negev is, look it up. The land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt, going down to Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Solomon reigned over all that land that the Lord gave him. 2 Chronicles 9.26 So he reigned over all the kings from the river of the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. So no promise. There it is. In the Bible that the Jews will return to the land or that the land is theirs. After this. After this happens. So the consequences. We kind of looked at this last night. Too many literal resurrections. The Bible says one resurrection. There's the passage. I won't go over them again. We went over them. Jesus' earthly reigns ends in a revolt. If that was the consequence, that's how it would end in a revolt. If you look at Revelation 27 through 10, look at that and you'll, you'll see that. Cannot be born again now. Well, think about that. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, if it hadn't been established, how can you see the kingdom of God? Therefore, you can't be born again now. That's a consequence of it, of this, of this doctrine. Cannot, wait a minute, we observed the Lord's Supper a few minutes ago. If this doctrine is correct, we couldn't observe the Lord's Supper until that kingdom's literally found, established here on the earth. And that doctrine we're going to talk about this pre evening, that's before evening, see, pre evening because it's five o'clock, six o'clock, evening starts, right? That's what I always heard. Anyway, so this pre evening, five o'clock, we're going to talk about a doctrine that says you can't. You can't partake of the Lord's Supper because the kingdom has already come. The Lord's already come. He did all that in AD 70. We're not even to look for the Lord to return anymore, according to this doctrine that we're going to talk about at 5 o'clock. We're going to try to untwist all that this evening, or pre evening. Sorry about that. So, cannot observe the Lord's Supper now. And Christ is not priest now. But Zechariah 6, verse 12 talks about how he is. It's an imperfect system. And it replaces a perfect system, if it's so. So there's a consequence. It's a return to types and shadows type of worship. You see, the temple 
and the worship of the Old Testament was a, a shadow of what was to come. And so if we return to that, they talk about, well, they've got to go somehow and get some sales from the red heifer, find a red heifer because the red heifer is like the dodo bird, it's extinct. So in order to restart these sacrifices, we've got to somehow clone the red heifer. We've got to get that thing created again somehow. How are they going to do that? I don't know. They're still working on that idea. And, then have, and they're going back to that old system, which was a shadow of what was to come. So it's imperfect. So again, it's not in the Bible. The kingdom has been established. Christ is on David's throne in heaven now. The second coming ends Christ's reign. And we've looked at Revelation 20, does not teach it, and we've looked at the consequences. So will Christ reign on the earth? No. He will not reign a thousand years on the earth. He's now ruling and reigning. So I'll say the word everybody likes to hear, finally. You say, finally, finally. What must I do to be saved? Here it is. The Philippian jailer was told, Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Doesn't end there. It's kind of like asking someone how I go from here to Tampa, Florida. First thing you're going to tell me leaving here, you're going to tell me what interstate to, to get on to start heading the direction I need to go. But now if I go by way and I travel enough to get over to Atlanta, Georgia, you're not going to give me the same directions in Atlanta, Georgia you're going to give me from Dallas, Texas, are you? What about if I get down to Valdosta, Georgia? I'm probably getting some places you don't know where they are now. But Valdosta, Georgia, southern Georgia, I'm going to hear a different direction. I'm going to be on the same interstate coming out of you know, 75 coming out of Atlanta that I would be on, but I'm going to hear a different way to get to it in Valdosta, Georgia, than I'm going to hear in Atlanta, Georgia. Then I get down to Ocala, Florida, I'm going to hear directions all different, Gainesville, Ocala area, uh, until I get down to, to Tampa. And then I'll be there. So same idea here. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's his starting point. He's got to start with belief. Jesus said, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So we've got to start there. Then we find in Acts 17, 20, the time of this ignorance God overlooked now commands all men everywhere to repent. Change his life, 180 degree change in how we've lived. Live for Jesus now. Live for the Lord. The Ethiopian eunuch, Acts 8, verse 37, said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the confession we must make. Acts 10, verse 48, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Baptism is important. Galatians 3, 27, we're baptized into Christ. We put on Christ. We've been clothed with Christ. We live the life that he wants. He's our example how to live and then be faithful unto death. If you're subject to the invitation in any way, we urge you to come as together we come and our brother comes and leads us in the song.